Um, it's interesting to read uh, the sentence uh, so that you know what you can do or what you cannot do uh, in Hungary in, in any way in the, in, in the parliament there. So there is a dangerous climate uh, that has been created in which uh, uh, the government is not only monopolizing the public sphere but is also intruding into the private sphere, uh, trembling on fundamental rights of, of people. Since the very beginning, you know, uh, the Aldi group has taken uh, uh, a firm stance in, 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 in de denouncing uh, uh, these um, attacks against our core values and our, our rights. Uh, and certainly, let's be honest, uh, Hungary is not, certainly not the only EU member states uh, where the strict application of the rule of law and respect for fundamental rights is not uh, satisfactory. Uh, but the recent events have made the issue, I think, uh, more than urgent. And so far, uh, European Commission and the Council have remained silent uh, despite uh, the warning signal raised by the civil society organizations and also by uh, an international organization as the Council of uh, Europe. And that's the main and first main purpose of our hearing of today, to make sure that the facts are uh, known and that, again, the issue is raised into this House. Um, and that's the reason why we have uh, 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 organized uh, this meeting. Uh, we think that this is only a first step. Um, it's not a good thing that uh, the issue is not put on the agenda of the plenary uh, agenda of uh, this uh, House or that there are hesitations uh, by political groups uh, to, uh, to do so. Uh, it's uh, far too important uh, to diminish the application of the core values of uh, the Union because that is at, at stake. And so we, we think that firm, concrete reaction is therefore needed. Um, we cannot simply say, okay, oh yeah, uh, we shall wait until new mechanism has been adopted uh, by the Commission. Uh, of by the European Union that has already been done in May of uh, this uh, year. Uh, but let's be honest, this new mechanism that has been created by the Commission that has been purely only uh, an instrument on paper. It has never been uh, uh, used uh, un uh, until now. Um, where nevertheless there are very clear uh, breaches of the rule of law and, and fundamental uh, rights. And on top of that, it cannot also be an excuse, this new mechanism that has not been used, uh, to, uh, to say then, okay, yeah, uh, it's an excuse uh, to avoid triggering uh, the treaty itself, uh, Article 7 uh, of uh, the treaty. Moreover, what we try to make uh, also clear is with this public hearing is that values of the European Union and fundamental rights are not the internal affairs of member states alone. When it concerns fundamental rights, there is nothing is such a thing as nationality. It's, a, it's a, a, a problem of the European Union in, uh, on a whole. And it's not uh, limited to national borders. It's not limited to nationality. Uh, core values and fundamental rights in the Union uh, are uh, uh, business of the uh, Union and of all the citizens uh, of the Union. So that was my short uh, introduction. Thank you very much for your presence. And I, I give uh, the, uh, the floor, uh, the, 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 the public hearing shall be chaired by, by Sophie Infeld, who is, uh, as you know, Vice President of the Alliance of Liberal Democrats uh, uh, for Europe. So, Sophie, you have the floor, the hammer, <laughs> uh, so everything what you need. <laughs> Um, yes, there will be limits to democracy when I chair the debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, thank, you, thank you very much, Guy, and uh, thanks uh, for everybody uh, who's here. First of all, uh, our panelists that I will introduce uh, in a minute, uh, and thanks to all those who've, who've come here to participate in the debate, and uh, also to those who are viewing us via web stream. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite happy and proud to be a member of the group that is hosting uh, such a session. I was disappointed that the EPP and the Socialists did not uh, support our proposal to have a plenary debate on this, because really this is not about a particular uh, country. This is a debate about our shared values and how we uphold them 
if one member of our family has difficulty in protecting those fundamental values. And this is actually about a test of ourselves, a test of the European Union as a community of values. We've written down those values in treaties, and they've been written down by civil servants and diplomats, but now it's up to us to put them into practice and to defend them when they are put to the test. Uh, and I think uh, they are put to the test in, uh, in all of our countries because there isn't a single EU member state that is completely free of fundamental rights violations. Um, but I think Hungary presents a particular challenge at the moment because there is, um, there, there is such a, a general threat to fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, freedom of the media, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of education, uh, equal treatment and, and equal, uh, equal rights, um, independence of the judiciary, independence of the central bank, it's, you know, their, their problems compound. And that's why I think uh, it is proper for the European Parliament to, to debate these things and um, put them on the agenda. And I hope that we're going to have a real debate today uh, a real exchange of views with uh, different viewpoints. Um, and I'm not going to eat up more of our, uh, of our time today. I'm going to proceed to uh, introducing our panelists. They will each do a short introduction of uh, about eight to ten minutes, and then we'll open the floor to debate, uh, and then we'll proceed to the second round uh, of this session, and then we'll close at seven o'clock. Um, First of all, I'm, uh, I'm particularly pleased to welcome to my left uh, Mrs. Uh, Anne Brasseur, who, as Guy said, uh, is chairing the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe which has been very vocal uh, on the situation in Hungary. Um, then to her left, Mr. Andras Nun, who is the director of the uh, Autonomia Foundation, I already apologize in advance for massacring uh, you know, all Hungarian uh, terms and pronunciation. Um, uh, the Foundation is a member of the Foundation's consortium managing the implementation of the Norway grants that play a uh, particular role in this debate. Uh, then uh, via a web link, uh, and I hope it works, we welcome Mrs. Stefania Kapronsai, Executive Director of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. Then uh, further to my left, Mr. Attila Mong, who is a, a journalist and board member of uh, Adlatso.hu, uh, investigative, investigative journalism NGO and journalism expert at Mertek Media Monitor. Uh, and to my far left, Mrs. Lydia Gall, uh, who is a Balkans and Eastern Europe researcher at Human Rights Watch. So um, I'm going to ask you to each do uh, a short introduction, um, and maybe I'll start with Mr. Andras Nun, uh, and I'll ask you to each really stick to the eight to ten minutes, so we'll have plenty of time for uh, debate. Mr. Mung, uh, Mr. Nun, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ade, for the invitation. Thank you, all of Mike, you, for Mike, Mike. No, the, coming. The, the, sorry, the mic is, yes, is it okay. on? Oh, this okay. one. Okay. That one works, yeah. But you heard it, right? Okay. Um, well, maybe I, I will be a bit longer than eight minutes, but it will be so exciting that you, you want me to continue, I assure you, because it's an interesting story. Uh, I, I will be factual uh, so that you can have your opinion afterwards what's going on. Uh, and you can challenge with questions later, of course. Uh, so as might you, have, you have heard that uh, on 8th of September, police raided uh, offices and private houses of staff of two NGOs, the Kotash and Demnet Foundations, and confiscated laptops, uh, dossiers, and computer servers. Both organizations are members of the consortium responsible for the distribution of the NGO fund supported by Norway, Liechtenstein, and uh, Iceland. Uh, and the fund is for NGOs in Hungary. So how have we ended up here? I would like to summarize the background that police appeared in our offices. Uh, as you might know that there was a, an NGO fund in Hungary in between 2008 and 2011. Uh, at that time, already 16 countries were beneficiaries, and only in four countries 
that were NGOs who distributed the grant. In the rest of the countries, governments were responsible for even NG, for NGO funds. Uh, after the end of the first period, uh, Norwegians uh, asked Ernst & Young, a big company, to evaluate the work. And uh, on the basis of the evaluation, uh, they decided that in the next period, between 13 and 16, uh, in each country, the NGO funds should go to an independent NGO and not to government. That's the final conclusion of the evaluation. Of course, it's an audition, and they, they uh, signaled certain uh, points which should be improved, but the general conclusion was that NGO fund is better operated by NGOs which are close to the sector. Uh, there are bilateral agreements between donor states and Hungary uh, for the next period, and it's about uh, 150 million euros, from which only 4 million goes to NGOs. So Norwegians and the donor countries said this 4 million shouldn't be handled by the state but independent NGOs. So therefore, uh, they uh, opened the tender for bidders, and on the bid they selected a consortium in which our uh, organization, Autonomia, is a member and led by Ökotash Foundation. Uh, so it's important to stress that the NGO fund does not go through the state treasury. Uh, Hungarian state bears no responsibility in running the NGO fund. This means that Hungary has no legal and no financial nor auditing responsibility in this fund. According to the agreement, Hungary and the donor states, only represent, uh, Hungarian state only represents themselves as observers and have no voting rights when it, it is about selection of projects within this grantee scheme. Uh, it is also important to note that in the new round, so from 13, there are new thematic eras uh, in the second NGO fund, and there is a strong emphasis on the following issues. Democratic development, anti-corruption, good governance, human and minority rights, fight against hate speech and violence. This was not the case in the first period between 2008 and 10. Uh, 11. Then the thematic areas was use, environmental protection, uh, cultural heritage, and social inclusion. So these issues like democratic development, anti-corruption, good governance, human and minority rights, fight against hate speech was not in the focal focus of the program. Uh, new beneficiary names were published in the course of autumn, uh, in the course of summer of last year. And right following this, uh, pro -government we a pro-government weekly accused the NGO fund, <coughs> fund being partisan and being under the control of Open Society Institute uh, or Open Society Foundations, and they reveal so far confidential names of evaluators, and they suggest that there is a conspiracy behind this program. Then a uh, year of silence happened, at least not, uh, it was, uh, not in the media, it wasn't really loud, but uh, investigative journalists found out that in the background, Mr. Navrasic, who now is the Minister of the European Union, tried to challenge the Norwegian government that the selection of the Grand Manager Consortium was not fair or transparent and kept filing complaints that none of the other competitors for the work made it to the shortlist. Norwegians denied accusations, saying that other bidders for this work simply did not qualify. Namely, they were not independent from state, and they had no experience in grant making. The organizations I'm representing here, these four, they have uh, at least 20 years of experience in grant making, and we are professional bodies. We are not politicians, and we are not playing any polit political game, and haven't been. Uh, into that business. Uh, so we are in this year in 14, early 14, uh, without consulting Norwegian government, Hungarian state closed down the National Development Agency, the organization responsible for the only Europe, uh, uh, not for only European, but also Norwegian funds managed by the state. 
uh, and also remove the appointed focal point, which was, which was agreed in the bilateral agreement. So this is for the money which goes directly to state and not for NGOs. Uh, the new appointed grant manager body was not part of the state administration, so transparency and control was not ensured. Therefore, Norwegian Foreign Ministry uh, saying that this is the breach of the agreement between the states suspended the further disbursement of funds to Hungary except the NGO fund. Uh, in April of 14, accusations reappear in the pro-government media that the NGO fund, which again was and still is not under the control of the state, is biased. <coughs> right after the result of the parliamentary elections, uh, which again resulted in a two-third majority, the minister of the prime minister's office made an accusation that managers of the NGO fund are nobodies who are close to one of the opposition parties and support problematic organizations. Again, in a pro-government newspaper, a state official announced that government initiate an independent audit into the use of the NGO funds. June 14, the lead of the consortium that manages the NGO fund, Ökotaj, received a letter from the Government Control Bureau that they start the investigation at, the, at a certain day and hour on a Monday. But auditors did not show up. Instead, they appeared at offices of two other members of the consortium, Autonomia Foundation and Demlet Foundation. Later in that afternoon, they also went to Ökotaj's office. In the warrant, they claim that the Norwegian NGO fund is Hungarian public money and they have the right to investigate. They threaten the organizations if they not collaborate, they have the right to find them or suspend their tax number, which means that the organization cannot work in, in the future. An independent web portal asked, the, asked and received the Prime Minister's office the list of the so-called problematical 13 beneficiaries. Uh, as they say, problematical means critical and leftish. And they received the list, and you can see one of the listed organizations member, Attila Mong, next to me. Uh, all other listed organizations are dealing with minority rights issues, anti-corruption, uh, good governance, and minority rights and uh, fight against hate speech. Uh, Norwegian decla Norwegians declared that such an audit is a violation of the agreement as any responsibility for potential audits rested with the donor states, namely Liechtenstein, Norway, and Iceland. The Norwegian authorities informed that Hungary had to meet the three requirements stipulated in the agreement, and they demand that the audit of the NGOs had to be halted. Later in the summer of 14, uh, the following things happened. Uh, through its controlled media, a severe campaign against the NGO fund managers and beneficiaries started. One can hardly follow how the accusations changed over a weekly basis. Uh, throughout the summer, Government Control Bureau requested all documentations in connection to the NGO fund in several rounds. Uh, roughly four or five times they sent letters to us uh, with long lists, which took weeks to collect. Uh, fund managers or foundations refused to hand over two of crucial documents list and data of details of applicants, these are several thousands, and documents in relation to winners, such as applications, evaluation sheets, contracts and reports, claiming that all these are non-public and, and uh, uh, the handlers of this data are the Norwegians. Norwegians also stated in a letter sent to the government control that it's their business and none of the Hungarian control office uh, business. Uh, also, it should be noted uh, that in the middle of summer, there was a case in the Hungarian pub, uh, um, political arena. Uh, uh, an investigative journalist asked data from travelings of certain ministers, and he just singled out one uh, travel cost which belonged to uh, uh, Lazar Janos, uh, and the amount of the travel was so high that he wanted to know the details because he spent uh, around 3,000 euros per night in a hotel. 
So, uh, but the minister or, or the uh, office was not uh, ready to give the data, and then he went to court, court and the court uh, made a decision that it should be revealed and everyone should know uh, where the money went and what was the uh, aim of the meeting. Uh, at that point, Mr. Lazar Janos said, okay, I'm paying the money back and forget the story. But it was not the end. The uh, editor of this web magazine was removed. At least that's the uh, uh, thing what we, we, we think, that uh, it was removed from the position. And there was a protest against this move uh, in the streets of Budapest. Uh, and one of the organizers of the protest went into a TV studio and he admitted that some money from the Norwegian fund was spent on this demonstration, which is about uh, freedom of press. Uh, this case was a very handy case for the government saying that uh, Norwegian money is used for political purposes and basically they are supporting un anti-government movements. Uh, that was the case, and still we are fighting that, that express, expressing uh, 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 political opinions is not playing party politics, and it, it is the right uh, of each of the citizens. And it is the right of NGOs to express opinions. Uh, uh, after uh, the State Control Bureau, uh, Government Control Bureau, investigate, uh, started an investigation at our foundations who are managing the fund, they also sent... Uh, inquiry letters to eight, uh, 58 uh, beneficiaries, uh, not, uh, almost all of them collaborating or cooperated with them. Uh, a few of them refused, and they publicized the requested documents on the web, and only one organization formally refused to send anything to this control bureau. Uh, staff of the government control bureau constantly giving interviews, leaking information from the Gadea documents to the state media, who then fabricate further accusations against the NGO fund and the individual beneficiaries. On the web page of the Bureau, news from the pro-government media appeared that now evidences show that liberal, leftish and gay lobby is behind the NGO fund. July 14. Prime Minister announces at a summer jamboree that liberal democracy in Hungary will end and accused NGOs interfering with politics and serving foreign interest. August 14. A state official said in a TV talk that the investigation will have results at the end of September, but semi results indicate that organized criminals are behind the NGO fund and it seems that state will have no other chance but step and make a criminal case out of it. Uh, Budapest, Budapest Chief Prosecutor's Office started the investigation uh, uh, against embezzlement against an unknown perpetrator. Media found out that the accusation was sent by a private person from an Fidesz email address. State denies that they are behind the case. Police contacted the Kotaj, the lead of the consortium who is managing the NGO fund, requested documents which were sent by deadline. On 1st of September, I'm close to the end of the story, on 1st of September, the last call for project proposal was announced by our consortium, the NGO fund. Deadline for applications is 15th of October. On the morning of 8th, a week later, uh, 41 policemen raided the Kotash searched its office and two houses of the staff till 9 p.m. in the evening and took away documents in relation to the 13 organizations copied files and the databases, confiscated laptops and servers. Now state has everything what had not been given to the government control bureau, namely all the applications, all the names, all the data, all the contracts, all the reports, all the correspondence between the managing foundations of the NGO fund. Uh, so, so far I try to be factual and I have only a, a question mark at the end. How to discredit the work of non-governmental organizations in Hungary? That's the story about, at least to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then now we're going to listen to the statement of Mrs. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you very much. 
Now we're going to listen to the statement of Mrs. Stefania Kaporonsai, Executive Director of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, via a web link. And I hope it's up. Hello, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We hear you fine. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you for being here. You have the floor for about 10 minutes. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the flexibility of the organizers for allowing to join the conversation this way. Um, first, I will uh, say a few sentences about the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, and then I have two uh, major arguments. One is about, one is about uh, uh, that NGOs are part of a system of checks and balances, and that's why NGOs, independent NGOs, are under attack in Hungary. And in, in my second argument, I will uh, uh, shortly recap uh, the escalating campaign uh, against Hungarian NGOs. So about the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, uh, it was established in 1994. It's a human rights watchdog uh, NGO with the mission of, um, of monitoring um, the actions of the state and uh, protecting the rights of individuals, of individual citizens. As you are probably aware of it, uh, both in 2010 and 2014, the current ruling party won a supermajority in the Hungarian parliament, which means that they have constitution-making power. This power was misused for constitutional demolition, and from this suffered the system of checks and balances, independent institutions, and the protection of fundamental rights. The first term of the government started with uh, attacks on critical journalism through the media law and, uh, and establishing the media authority. Um, when, uh, the government adopted some unconstitutional laws and when the constitutional court annulled them, uh, the government rapidly restricted the authority of the court. Then in an extraordinarily hasty process, uh, the government replaced the constitution with a fundamental law. And this new constitutional framework imposed uh, restraints on the fundamental freedoms of citizens rather than the public power. Instead of limiting state intervention into the lives of individuals and their various relationships, um, uh, the Hungarian state now has, uh, has, uh, uses law as a leverage to claim to right to define the spheres of privacy and private relationships among individuals. After this, uh, the government quickly gained control over independent institutions, such as uh, the Data Protection Ombudsman that was also addressed by an EU proce procedure. The new system uh, that uh, was uh, constructed fails to meet the principle of division of power. As it was mentioned uh, before, uh, the Strasbourg Court had, has condemned Hungary for uh, breaching the freedom of expression of uh, members of the parliament. Um, in, under such conditions, uh, it, it is clear that watchdog NGOs play an instrumental role in, in defending de democratic principles and human rights. Watchdog NGOs, by their nature, monitor the state and the actions of the government. So, therefore, I believe that they, they are part of the system of checks and balances. So, it is not a surprise that the second term of the Orban, Orban government started with an escalating campaign against Hungarian NGOs and also online uh, media, as it was mentioned before by uh, Mr. Nun. Uh, as it was mentioned as well, there are two types of, um, uh, of um, measures or means of this campaign against uh, independent NGOs. One of them is rhetoric that was shortly recapped by, by Mr. Noon, uh, and there are also administrative measures. The goals of this, this campaign are to gain control over independent financing mechanisms, uh, such as the Norwegian NGO Fund, which are very important for uh, watchdog NGOs, such as the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, as we are not applying or accepting any money that comes from the state or the government. And uh, the other goal is uh, to harm the reputation, to question the credibility of independent NGOs, which serve as a, as a, as a counter power to government power. Um, talking about the, the escalating campaign, was already mentioned uh, the, the press statements from 2013 and the blacklist 
from this uh, year, May 30th, which named 13 organizations the beneficiaries of, of the Norwegian NGO Fund supported under protecting democratic values and human rights, and my organization was named on this list as well. Then uh, the government control office launched an investigation against 58 of those uh, NGOs which benefited from either this or the previous uh, financial term of the Norwegian NGO uh, grant. It is unknown al along which criteria these NGOs were chosen. Uh, we also, uh, similarly to what I have mentioned before, we argue that the governmental control office has no jurisdiction to audit uh, the spending of these uh, funds. That's why we refuse to cooperate uh, with the investigation. However, we, as we have nothing to hide and we want to work in a transparent manner, we published uh, all the, the, the full documentation of these grants on our website. And we also launched a Freedom of Information request uh, asking about the order that mandated the, the governmental control office uh, to carry out the investigations. And as we have not received any answer to this uh, request, we launched a, a lawsuit uh, um, actually on the day when uh, the offices of Ökotash and Damnet were raided, but this happened only by accident. Um, I also wanted to mention the statement uh, of, uh, that you have probably heard about from this year's July, the infamous speech of Mr. Orban uh, talking about an illiberal state. It is, uh, it is impossible, to, impossible not to be reminded of uh, the rhetorics about watchdogs in Russia, uh, about the foreign agent laws, when we hear about uh, the, those political activists that are financed by foreigners and that are serving foreign interests. And this is uh, probably a reference to the independent NGO sphere in Hungary, which is especially uh, absurd in light of the fact that uh, uh, that uh, government politicians are worried that alternative thinkers uh, have not received any funding from the Norwegian NGO fund money. At the same time, the National Cooperation Fund, which is the government fund uh, for supporting civil society, uh, the head of this fund is the same person who leads uh, pro-government marches, uh, and which are organized by the Civil Collaboration Fund. So, uh, to sum up, I, would, I want to have two points. Uh, one is about our role as uh, the Hungarian civil society, and obviously this um, um, campaign against uh, independent NGOs uh, plays challenges to us that we have to resolve among ourselves. But at the same time, I believe that uh, these uh, attacks are also attacks against the core values and, uh, and the fundamental principles of the European Union. Therefore, the European Union should act on them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And do stay with us because uh, we'll have a debate and, and questions uh, later on. We'll also be collecting, incidentally, questions and remarks from uh, people watching this via the web stream and who may try to put in questions via Twitter, for example. Uh, I have two more speakers in this, this round. I'm really going to ask you to also be concise and, and leave time for uh, debate. Uh, next is Mr. Attila. Mong from the, uh, the board member from Atlas Show. Thank you very much and thank you for <clears throat> having me here. Yes, I'm representing one of the uh, dirty 13 organizations like NGOs who are labeled by the government as uh, foreign agents uh, who receive um, funds from abroad. And this is a non-profit investigative journalism site I will be speaking about. So I will be speak, speaking about the, about the site and about um, why media and why the NGOs are now targeted. So four years ago, when the Orban government changed the new media legislation, a lot of people asked in Hungary and internationally too, why media? Why introducing such a repressive and harsh media legislation in Hungary in the age of technology where anyway it will be very difficult to enforce uh, strict rules in media. So why uh, changing the media legislation? Uh, 
It was in 2010 and well before anyone could realize what Fidesz and the government would uh, change in the country, so the complete overhaul of the Hungarian constitutional, legal, electoral and political setup, and well before anybody could guess that media is part of a bigger strategy. Um, the strategy was about eliminating checks and balances in Hungarian society, and media was an important uh, checks and balance, um, and independent media especially. Unfortunately, I was among the few he, who instinctively guessed what would happen. At the time, I was at the Hungarian radio, and I protested against the Hungarian media legislation with one minute of silence. And I left the Hungarian radio, and I went to work in private media. So fast forward... Uh, four years later, um, I'm a board member of a small independent investigative journalism NGO, Atlatso, which is receiving funds from the Norwegian grants. And what I see, I see a Putin-style police raid on NGOs. And the question again is why? I mean, why a bunch of small NGOs are attacked? These are really small NGOs. Our NGO has a, an annual budget of a roughly a little more, more than 120,000 euros per year. So it's really tiny, small um, NGOs. And the question is why our activities, which are really transparency, fight against anti-corruption, freedom of information request, requests, why all this suddenly is becoming dangerous in the eyes of the Hungarian government, and why are we considered foreign agents just because we receive international funding. So the question is again why, and the answer I think is very simple again because there is a bigger picture, there is a bigger strategy, and fortunately the good thing is that we don't have to guess anymore because we have personally Viktor Orban who gave a speech uh, just recently and Steffi uh, already quoted that, that speech in, in which the Prime Minister is speaking about a new era of Hungary e establishing an illiberal political system which would resemble more uh, Russia, China, or Singapore than the Western-style democracies uh, Hungary was eager to join uh, 25 years ago. And in this context, winning the media war is really important. Just look at Russia. I mean, Russia is a great example. So strangely enough, on the media market, the NGOs, so the small NGOs like ours, the small investigative journalism uh, NGO, is, are, are the latest ones to fight. Because uh, why are we the latest ones to fight? Because all the rest of the media, ru very roughly speaking, and I'm speaking about news media, is domesticated. Most of uh, Hungarian media is domesticated. So I will summarize very briefly what happened during the last four years, so how Fidesz and the government won the media war. Just a reminder, the OSC uh, qualified the Hungarian uh, elections, uh, spring elections as free but not fair, and one of the reasons was the media situation. So just very briefly what happened in the media. First of all, there were three main developments, legal, legislative changes, occupying public media with the help of the legislation, and domesticating, domesticating private media with very different methods, mainly using advertising market, taxes, and ownership pressure. Legislative changes very Quickly, this, this was the media law. It helped to reorganize public media. It helped to create a media authority. Uh, and the media authority was basically using its powers to distort certain important markets, like uh, very, uh, we can see very nicely how the radio market, the national commercial radio market was distorted, and the local radio market in favor of outlets supporting the government. Uh, for, the private for the private market, the legislation was not really enforced, but it does serve as a, as a threat uh, for most of the public media. It's a legislative threat. Occupying public media. The media legislation was an important element. It created the legal framework of centralizing and occupying public media outlet, changing the editors. So the public media today is basically a government mouthpiece, censorship and self-censorship is like everyday business in, um, in the public media. Domesticating private media, they use different methods, as I, I quoted, mainly attacking private media where they are, they are most vulnerable, the balance sheet. 
State advertising is allocated to friendly uh, media outlets and are not allocated to unfriendly and opposition-minded uh, outlets. It's, it's really important. State advertising can turn companies from profitable to unprofitable and vice versa. Ownership changes. Government-friendly oligarchs were taking over ailing publications and buying out media outlets, which were for sale. And there are a bunch of media companies which are not for sale, and against them they are using taxes to punish the owners. The best example, a recent example, is one of the biggest commercial TV stations, RTL, uh, which, uh, is, uh, whose news broadcast is critical, still critical of the government. The, the government introduced a media tax, which is basically punishing this only one commercial station. And... Uh, uh, for the media outlets which are not for sale, there is another method like forcing the owners to change the editors. Andras quoted the example of the biggest online publication whose editors were sacked because they were investigating the lavish travel expenses of one of the most prominent Fidesz politicians. So the aim is very clear for the private media. Either you accept the rules or uh, you, will be, you will be forced to go out of business. So why, again, NGOs um, are uh, a threat to the government? Because NGOs like small NGOs like ours, we cannot be influenced through advertising market because uh, we don't publish advertising or the share of advertising revenue is, is in our budget is really unimportant. We cannot be influenced through ownership changes because we are a non-profit, a small company, and we don't want to sell our shares. And we cannot be influenced because already 30 percent of our revenues come from the audience, so come from our readers, readers' contribution, and only 50, 60 percent of our revenues from big funders and international funders. So the only line, attack, line of attack against NGOs like us is the international funding. Orban's message is uh, clear. He wants uh, his hands to be the only one to feed the NGOs, and the message is if you don't want it, you will starve. So that's very clearly what uh, the government wants. And let me just finish with a very personal remark, because my career shows the Hungarian, uh, development, development of the Hungarian media situation. In 2011, I left the public media and said to myself, okay, they occupy the living room, but we can still work freely in the kitchen, so let, let's go to the private media and let's go to the kitchen. Uh, a year later, I left an online publication because of pressures uh, by business oligarchs, but I, thought, I said to myself, okay, they occupy a kitchen, but we still uh, can work in the pantry, it's still free. So I went to work for an NGO, Atlatso, which, is, which was created three years ago. Now it's becoming a very important publication for the Hungarian media. And now we are in 2014 working in the pantry, and they are knocking on our door. They are coming. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that that was a very strong uh, image. Uh, before giving the floor to uh, our last speaker, Mrs. Gall, uh, I, I got a, a couple of tweets with interesting remarks, and there's one question that I, I already give to you so you can consider it already for the debate afterwards. And one, uh, one uh, tweet is asking himself whether any sanctions from the EU against Hungary would be effective and whether uh, they would not only um, make it worse. So that is an interesting question, I think. So without further ado, um, I give the floor to Mrs. Gall from Human Rights Watch. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. We've already heard some of my co-panelists here mentioning the uh, complete overhaul of the legal system that has been taking place uh, since uh, 2010, which has served to undermine the respect for the rule of law and for checks and balances. So I thought I'd give you a few examples of what that actually means in real terms, and then I would also like to uh, address what, you know, the EU's role and what it could do and what has already been done. Um, so... 
the, the current overhaul of the legal system, um, you know, in real terms. I mean, we've seen how these legal changes has resulted in, for example, 300 judges who were forcibly uh, turned into early retirement and how new judges quickly replaced them through a new, newly established uh, national judicial office uh, where the president is, is, uh, is elected by, um, by the parliament. We've also seen how these legal changes has brought about uh, a restructuring of the constitutional court, how four new um, positions were added to the bench, making a total of 15, and how over time Parliament has appointed a total of eight judges, uh, making newly appointed judges on the constitutional court uh, in majority. Uh, we have seen how this restructuring, together with the fact that the powers of the constitutional court have been severely restricted and that that has undermined its independence and its ability to serve um, as a check on the executive authority. There are countless examples of how the constitutional court's powers have been restricted, but I think for, for time reasons, I shall zero in on one in particular, and that is that the constitutional court is now prevented from ruling on the substance of constitutional amendments. And the reason why I bring that example is because it has brought some strange twists to it, uh, should we say. So an example, of the, an example that I want to highlight is a 2002 law which banned homeless from residing in public areas. It was struck, it was struck down by the Constitutional Court in November uh, because, as the Court said, it violated human dignity. Now, instead of abiding by that law or by that ruling, uh, the ruling of its highest court, the, uh, the Parliament instead chose to amend the Constitution, include a provision which enabled the parliament and local governments to ban homeless from residing in public areas. And by doing so, it effectively barred the constitutional court from ruling on this particular substance matter. Um, and as a consequence of the constitutional court essentially being tied down, the parliament last September adopted a law that did actually enable uh, the banning of homeless uh, residing in public spaces. And in November, the city of Budapest followed suit. So at present, the latest number I have, 96 homeless people, and those are in Budapest, uh, have been charged with petty offenses uh, under this particular law. And many have been fined, and many risk uh, community work or jail uh, for repeat offenses. We've also seen how these legal changes have stripped hundreds of religious groups of their status as churches, which is sort of a legal status which makes them eligible for government subsidies. Uh, and the fact that they were stripped of this, this particular uh, status meant that they lost those subsidies. And the Fifth Amendment, which was adopted by the Parliament last September, was supposed to in some way address this. And so now what groups can do, they can refer to themselves as churches. But what this particular amendment fails to mention is that in order for, to apply for these particular government subsidies, it's not enough that you don't refer to yourself as a church, but a parliamentary committee rather than an independent body has to recognize this particular um, religious group as a church. So, and this is also an example of an approach that we have seen uh, where rather than actually getting to the underlying problems, uh, the government is engaged in, um, in uh, doing cosmetic changes. And actually, in a, in on the point of the, the, um, the, the stripping of, um, of, of the status, the Strasbourg Court mm -hmm. just a few days ago um, uh, upheld its earlier ruling that, this was, that Hungary had violated the freedom of speech, thought, and conscience by depriving churches uh, their status uh, and their state funding. The EU, I mean, and during the course of this time, the EU has done attempts to halt this authoritarian slide in Hungary. The Commission has started legal proceedings. Steffi mentioned one of them. Uh, and in the case of the uh, forced early retirement of judges, the Court of Justice of the European Union in 2012 ruled against Hungary. Unfortunately, at the time uh, when the court ruling was handed down, most of the affected judges uh, had already been replaced by new judges, so the ruling was essentially largely symbolic. And it's, again, an example of the approach taken by the government that, you know, ex post facto, um, you know, they, they can do some cosmetic changes. 
Another thing that we've seen is that East, like the European Commission actions are often uh, focused on narrow and not not uh, always on, not on human rights specific issues, uh, which has made it quite easy for the Hungarian authorities to make these um, cosmetic changes to laws while you know, the underlying problem, problems remain unaddressed, which was the case uh, with the forced early retirement uh, of the judges. On last July, uh, the European Parliament uh, produced a very strong report on Hungary, the, also known as the Tavarish Report, but since then uh, no real action has, has followed. And as was mentioned, uh, in the April elections, the government won another term, uh, retaining its supermajority. And since then, we have seen this renewed pressure on the media and attacks on civil society. And it, it shows that the Hungarian government uh, doesn't really aim to uh, reverse its uh, course on rule of law and human rights. And Mr. Orban's speech in July, uh, where he declared that he wanted to end liberal democracy, uh, quite frankly, points in the exact opposite direction. Yet, again, his speech and the latest harassment of civil society and of the media in Hungary has been met with silence, essentially, from the EU. And this is very unfortunate, because, which was also mentioned here, although the situation in Hungary is particularly challenging, uh, it, Hungary is not the only member state with, a long -standing, uh, with long standing human <coughs> rights problems. Serious human rights abuses exist in, in many other uh, member states, uh, documented by Human Rights Watch, documented by many other civil society organizations. These issues rain, uh, range from mistreatment of migrants to racist violence to um, discrimination against Roma to abusive police sweeps and ethnic profiling, and the list goes on. Uh, these rights abuses all touch on the values that are listed in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. Rule of law, human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, and respect for human rights. And abuses of these values are suffered by real people and affect the lives of, of ordinary real persons just like all of us here. Uh, and that's why the EU urgently needs to give real meaning to the full set of values listed in Article 2 in a way that brings actual results. The case of Hungary in particular has triggered a growing recognition that more is needed to ensure an effective EU response to human rights abuses in the EU. And the European Parliament should play a key, key role in taking this debate forward. This is what Human Rights Watch and 47 colleague organizations, um, part of the Human Rights and Democracy Network, has been engaging on to make the most of this opportunity uh, and to build on this existing momentum. The ultimate show uh, would be to develop a comprehensive uh, internal human rights strategy that mirrors EU's external strategic framework. And such a, such a framework should be accompanied by a corresponding uh, action plan uh, to guide collective EU action, drawing inspiration from the 2012 EU strategic framework and action plan on human rights and democracy, which pledges to promote human rights across all areas of EU's external actions without exceptions. But in the meantime, EU institutions can and should take concrete steps right away to uh, make use of the tools that already exist. The Commission, for instance, should make better use of the infringement proceedings and sustain them until the problems are fully addressed and fully resolved. The Council Working Group on Fundamental Rights and uh, Free Movement of Persons, uh, also known as the FREMP, uh, this is a forum where member states can discuss human rights problems in the Union. Uh, it should more embrace its mandate and it should engage with other entities, uh, such as the Fundamental Rights Agency, the European Parliament, NGOs, Council of Europe, and UN mechanisms, and ensure adequate follow-up uh, on their findings. And the European Parliament should follow up on previous work, such as the mentioned Tavares report on Hungary that came out last year in July, and the February report this year on fundamental rights in the EU. Because, quite frankly, if the EU is not prepared to defend its rights values at home, how can it credibly do so abroad? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I think uh, your uh, concluding question is a very pertinent one. How can we have any moral authority at all in the world if we are not even able to uh, 
protect and promote our values within the borders of the european union a few short remarks before i open the floor to debate first of all i would like to mention that we would have liked to have the representative of the norwegian government here to respond to in particular mr nuun's presentation but unfortunately they were unable to come. secondly i think that an area that we should cover may be in another hearing because something tells me that this topic will not go away any time soon is education because in addition to what you have all said i am quite appalled by what is happening in the education sector and basically the government dictating the content of education materials and restricting the freedom of researchers and academics in pretty much the same way as you have described by using funds. and then a third remark on the possible response by the eu institutions. we are soon going to have a vote on the new european commission. mr juncker has stated very clearly that he will not tolerate any fundamental rights violations and that he will act and more decisively so than the previous commission or the outgoing commission i should say. i am also interested to hear the responses of the vice president designate in charge of fundamental rights and the rule of law for the first time mr timmermans who is i think pretty devoted to fundamental rights. so i am interested to hear what the commission will have to say and if we can rely on the commission to act as the custodian of the treaties that she is supposed to be. and let us not forget the council because the colleagues of mr orbn are meeting with him regularly and they have lunches and they sit next to him and they probably say how are you doing? but i have never heard that the issue of the rule of law and fundamental rights has been raised with him during council meetings. so i am going to open the floor for debate. anybody can intervene. yes now i see hands raised. i already have a number of requests for the floor. i am going to take down your names one by one. i do not know all the names so please state your name and your function or the organisation you represent when you take the floor and please really limit yourself to an intervention of no more than a minute a minute and a half so everybody has the opportunity to intervene and i would encourage everybody to intervene including those who might disagree with the presentations that have been made so we can have a real debate. so i am going to first give the floor to mr javor i hope i pronounced that right over there and then i will work that down the list. you have the floor. thank you mr president. thank you for all the meps and friends coming to this hearing. i am benedek javor a green mep from hungary and deeply concerned about the developments the recent developments in hungary. Yesterday, our uh, friends uh, at EPP uh, did not uh, support uh, to uh, uh, have a plenary debate about Hungary, saying that there is no new development in Hungary. I would wish them having an office occupied by the special police, and then after we can talk about having any uh, development in Hungary or not. Basically, the situation was quite clearly described uh, by our friends from, from Hungary. But uh, I have to add that yesterday the Hungarian Parliament had its opening session, and uh, the Prime Minister uh, Orban clearly stated that the problem with the NGOs, uh, which get or received uh, funding from the Norwegian grants, is that they serve foreign interests. This means that uh, in Hungary um, there is not only pressure uh, on the NGO sector, but uh, Hungary and the Hungarian government started to use the Russian model to undermine the credibility uh, of the NGO sector, and they use uh, these words, and also they use uh, the accusation of uh, different uh, bureaucratic uh, mistakes, uh, basically to, to uh, uh, oppress 
civic uh, activity and NGO activity in, in Hungary. This is clearly a political witch hunting, also if we take into consideration that there are clear proofs that uh, during the time Fidesz is accusing the NGO sector uh, to be close to the opposition, this is a crime in Hungary right now, to be close to the opposition, uh, uh, but uh, other uh, NGOs are financing and this is approved financing Fidesz campaigns. So th there is a, a clear difference between different NGOs close to the opposition, which is a crime, and close to the government, uh, which um, uh, against the Hungarian law can finance uh, uh, the, the Hungarian government. And the last remark, sorry, um, uh, Mr. President. Um, Investigative journalism, I think it's a key element in fighting against this uh, oppression and also a clear sign uh, from uh, the European Parliament uh, is, is very important uh, to express uh, uh, our uh, support and, and uh, uh, some solidarity with, with these uh, NGOs. And I have an initiative to give this year's Sakharov Prize to one of the NGOs, the Ökotash Foundation, um, uh, which is under uh, governmental pressure uh, in Hungary. This is a symbolic step to express that uh, the European Parliament is standing by the Hungarian NGOs under uh, pressure. So I would like to ask the MEPs to join this uh, initi initiative and to sign uh, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be a bit more straight with the, the next speakers, otherwise uh, we won't uh, have enough time. Uh, I got a request for the floor for Mr. Niedermeyer, but I think he's left. No, then next on the list is Mr. Cavada. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Uh... Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say this. Finally, the European Parliament is now beginning to look at this democratic tragedy, the situation uh, provoked by uh, this autocratic party in your country. Somebody compared Mr. Orban to Mr. Putin a moment ago, and I fully agree with that view. Here we have an individual who wants to change the borders of Hungary and enlarge the country. Uh, wants to uh, extend the status of second generation expatriates Hungarians to the second generation. He wants to change Hungary. He wants to change the media system into what he calls a communication system, which is not a media system. And finally, he wants to uh, change the judicial system. These are all facts. Facts right now. Now, in this parliament, as a, a president of the intergroup media, I organized two uh, uh, sessions to debate uh, what was happening to the media in your country. And I have to say, it's an enormous shame to see the theft, the cowardness, or the cowardice, I should say, uh, with which one of our great institutions has acquitted itself. We've asked two previous European commissions to apply Article 7. That's to say, suspend membership of Hungary from the European Union. Uh, this was threatened in the case of Austria some years ago with great success. And when tackling the Commission, all we had in, by way of response uh, was what amounted to a shrugging of the shoulders. Uh, Hungary is the same country as it was back in 1956 when it was invaded by the Russians. It has great writers. It had great leaders. Uh, and these people reflect the soul of Hungary and the soul of Europe, I would say. It's a country which has uh, survived all sorts of crises, communism, the Nazi period. I don't need to uh, quote all the names uh, of your country. You know who they are. And also, of course, uh, you emerged from Soviet dominance back in 1989. Now, having said all that, we can't talk about serious fundamental rights in the European Union unless we tackle the situation in Hungary, seeking to uh, uphold their freedoms of liberties, which they have paid so dearly for over recent times. And this present government deserves dealing with and sanctioning.
sorry. <laughs> My name is Nicholas Baker. I'm the director of Amnesty International, Brussels. Um, indeed, Hungary is a very, very serious and very emblematic um, example of what can still go wrong in the European Union. But it is definitely only one example, and we need a much more credible and effective response. So I want to follow up on something that you just said yourself, Ms. Entwelder, that it is for all actors, Council, European Parliament, and European Commission, and it is for that reason that I would like to reinforce the statement just, just made by the last speaker from Human Rights Watch, um, that you know, over 100 NGOs, social NGOs and human rights NGOs, are calling not for a new mechanism or a big treaty reform, but we're calling the institutions to build together a robust EU internal human rights policy that enables the EU to be a credible and a strong human rights actor in Europe. And this is why we're calling for the strategy. And we're hoping that all of the parliamentarians will actually be asking questions to the commissioners, not only Timmermans, but also the Justice Commissioner and others, uh, basically to all commissioners, as whether they will be supportive of building this human rights strategy. It has to mean that we all take a step back to look at the big picture of human rights protection in Europe. What are the standards? How are they met in reality? And what is the EU's contribution to making them a reality? That is the questions we need to ask. The strategy needs to look at how the EU uses its competence to uphold and promote high standards. It needs to look at how the EU monitors the implementation of its own laws to ensure that they don't adversely affect human rights and effectively actually respect the protection of human rights of all people. And it needs to look how the EU ensures proper enforcement of its own legislation and we've heard before calls on, for example, the infringement procedures. And to look at how the EU reacts to human rights challenges that might not easily fit the EU box so simply and identify where the gaps are and how it can actually ensure effective protective of people, protection of people in Europe. Set priorities and action plans and have a better distribution of shared responsibilities. It needs a joint commitment of everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Wikström. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, actually, you started out on the line that I want to follow up on. You mentioned uh, Mr. Timmermans, who, will be, who is the Vice President uh, designate for the new Commission. But there is uh, the Hungarian representative, the Commissioner designate, Mr. Navracic, who is now the candidate for the portfolio of education, culture, youth, and citizenship. And I would simply turn to all of you to ask you, what would your advice be? Which questions should we trigger? He will be in a hearing with the Cultural Committee and my committee, the Petitions Committee. And I think that the, the fields that he will be responsible for are crucial. I mean, this is all about citizens. It's about the platform of values that the whole European project is built upon. And then coming back to what some of you already stated, uh, sanctions. We know that what needs to be triggered now is, is actually Article 7 of the treaties with sanctions. Today, nobody would question the stability pact that it would cost if you, breathe, if you are in breach with that. But when it comes to the values, the fundamental values, member states are free to act as they want with their own citizens, and this is, this is really a shame. So please give us some advice. I will personally be in that hearing, so I would be more than happy to have your advice on it. That is a very concrete question to our panel. Uh, Mrs. Renate Weber. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, it's already a very long history with, with Hungary and I visited your country with the official delegation of the European Parliament, participated in the report that was drafted on, on uh, Hungary. Uh, unfortunately, all the time it was about talk, 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 and not about acting. But when it's about, indeed, human rights, maybe also blaming and shaming, it's a solution in itself. And yes, I, will, uh, I wanted to say, actually, the same time with, with Cecilia, Mr. Navracic, although he's not assigned to a portfolio which deals with legislation within the EU, deals exactly with issues which are crucial for the democratic behavior of a country. To me, to hear that a minister uh, started a, a lawsuit <laughs> against the, the Norwegian agency, it looks like 
I don't know, is this Bolivia or what? <laughs> or, or a member of the <coughs> European Union? But I, I do have a very specific question. Because indeed, I also uh, would recommend all the colleagues to attend the hearings uh, of Mr. Navracic and to ask all these questions. Therefore, indeed, some details, if you can even send us by e email, that would be very welcome. But my very concrete question is that <laughs> I have raised several times the question of why uh, Orban and his followers want power just for the sake of the power, or it is also there related to corruption, to mismanagement of funds, be it intentional or negligence. Because to me, when it's about investigative journalism, that relates mainly with corruption and with uh, the, the mismanagement of, uh, of funds. And I would like to, to understand. Thank you. Cover up, you mean. Uh, next on the list, Mr. Pavel Tilichka. So I thank you, uh, Paul Delicka, the group. Uh, in fact, I have to start uh, by uh, uh, something which uh, might seem absurd today, but um, I think it was in 1998 when I was joining our Czech Prime Minister for the reestablishment of the Visegrad Group meeting in Budapest, which was chaired by Viktor Orban that, at that time, uh, very shortly in office. And that was without Slovakia at the time. It was because Mechiar was in a um, power primates in Slovakia, and we remember what the attitude was. So I would re really wonder now, and I'm sort of addressing it to uh, Prague, uh, Warsaw, and Bratislava, whether the next Visegrad summit will be with or without Viktor Orban. As concerns questions, I had a very similar question to Cecilia, so uh, I really would uh, appreciate a comment on on uh, what, to what extent uh, and what issues should we really the designated commissioner we should identify him entirely with Orban. I mean, can you give us a little bit of an insight in, into, into his role? I mean, his policies, of course, we have studied a lot, but I think you can give us uh, an insight. And the second question is, uh, um, it is an appalling situation, obviously, in, in Hungary, uh, but uh, I wonder, uh, with all the effort that we will be uh, uh, making, I have written a uh, written question, I have written yesterday to Orban, uh, we will have a hearing, hopefully we will have a debate in the plenary, uh, but have you spoken to the Commission? Uh, have you spoken directly? What was the, the reaction to the delegation of the Commission in Budapest, but also uh, uh, to uh, the, the Commission itself? So what is the reaction that you are getting? Uh, the feeling that I'm getting is that it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, an absurd silence around it. Uh, obviously, we expect much more, as Sophia said, uh, from the new Commission, but please give us a take on that. Thank you. Next one on the list, uh, Maite Pagazau Tundua. Sorry. Yes. I'll be very brief indeed. What we've heard this afternoon is very worrying indeed. It seems that the situation in your country has deteriorated, especially as far as civil liberties go. I think we should be as practical as possible. And I would like to thank those that have made some effort to be practical, practical here. I think we need a, a proper and uh, more continuous uh, channel uh, through which we can channel all information available. Uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, a series of uh, processes of re-education, for instance, etc., at national level. Is this something we could call political pathology? Could you perhaps... Tell us something about what is happening with Hungarian youth at the moment. What is the situation among young people? Are there dangerous undercurrents there, too, among uh, young people? Uh, what is their ideology at the moment? Uh, are they respectful of human rights or not? What are the tendencies amongst uh, the youth? Uh, and then we have this paradigm uh, uh, and uh, this issue of corruption, etc. What is the reaction of young people? How, 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 what is the pulse there? Have you taken the pulse of uh, young people in your country. I have four more requests for the floor. Oh, there's five. Okay, then I close the list because uh, we're also running out of time. Next on my list, uh, Mrs. Spinelli. Je voudrais d'abord remercier Alde pour le 
Could I first of all thank Alde for organizing this hearing and for trying to do something to uh, ensure that democracy is respected in Hungary. We've heard uh, some very interesting things this afternoon. Uh, we've heard what Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International and others have said about the rule of law in Hungary at the moment. And I think it's all rather alarming, really, and quite scandalous to think that uh, Mr. Orban, uh, what Mr. Orban is saying, is doing and saying, and uh, Mr. Navracic, who is being put forward as a commissioner. And what about the repercussions of all this on young people, uh, citizens' rights, etc.? I have written a letter to all colleagues. I wrote it on Sunday evening. In this letter, I ask that they reject this nomination. I listened very attentively to what Mrs. Wickstrom said. She is quite right. It is important to have some suggestions, some recommendations, some advice here on what questions should be put to the commissioner, to Commissioner Navracic. I think that we already have uh, an idea of what questions uh, we should put to him. Uh, as he is uh, a confidant of uh, uh, the government uh, there, then we know what questions we should ask him, because these are questions that we've been putting to Mr. Orban for years. Mr. Uspaskic. Thank you. I would like to congratulate the political group on uh, drawing its attention to what is happening in those countries, N not only what is, ha what is happening on, in the third countries, but also what, to what is happening inside the EU, because that is very important. I'm sure that if we promote European values, human rights, we have to defend them in all possible ways. Even a single case cannot be left without attention. Meetings like these should not end in just talks. We must make sure that we take action, that we include the whole European Parliament. The elder political group must uh, be the initiator and it must fight with ev together with everyone against the violations of human rights. We have to create working groups. We have to send uh, delegations to see what is happening there. We have to see everything in detail. We have to analyze everything. We should not hide behind the EU laws that, uh, in, that if a country is a, an EU member state, then it means that everything is okay there. It doesn't mean that everything is okay there. We should not close our eyes. And I know that sometimes uh, the EU is lied to, uh, wrong information is given. We have to analyze this situation. We have to make the conclusions. We have to vote on our decisions. Otherwise, that, be, that will be hypocrisy. We don't have to end our meetings in just words. Thank you. Three more speakers. Mr. Petr Jezek. Thank you. Well, I'm Petr Jezek, uh, ALDE MEP for ANO Movement, the Czech Republic. I'm taking floor because what I hear <laughs> reminds me of, of what, what we witness in our former, for, former lives uh, in the Czech Republic under the communist regime. It's the same behavior, I'm afraid, the same, the same language, uh, the same vocabulary, foreign forces, 
founding of, of uh, internal opposition and so on. I'm appalled. And uh, I also can recall uh, a paradox that uh, when the <laughs> communist regime was before collapse in the Czech Republic, it was young students from Fidesz who used to come to Prague to demonstrate for freedom, to demonstrate for human rights. So I'm afraid that it, it shows that, that power can change people easily or power corrupts. And uh, how to proceed? Well, I'm afraid that the opposition in Hungary is very weak. Media are more or less under, under control of the, of the government. And I would like also to ask our, our Hungarian friends what to do best, how to get the message across to the people in Hungary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kati Piri. Thank you. Um, I'm from the Socialist and Democratic Group in this European Parliament, uh, representing the Dutch Labour Party, but born in Hungary. And um, it's uh, a good signal to hear here from many colleagues uh, and many thanks for the Alder Group for organizing this important hearing, because I believe when we speak about the events in Hungary, we're not speaking about Viktor Orban as a right-wing politician or as a conservative or a Christian Democrat, he's an autocrat. So when we speak about Hungary, I think we should align uh, on political lines in this parliament, also looking at the majorities now, if we put this as a political issue, as a difference of political parties, we will not be able to make the fist we have to make within the European Union. So here's my call. I don't know if there are EPP colleagues in this room, I think it's very good if they are here, because this should be democratic politicians which are demonstrating against the credibility of the European Union. This is not a political party issue. So I would always like to ask our, our speakers to always reach out to also EPP politicians in order to also not just have this hearing, but to be able to make a fist. Thank you very much. Thank you for that call. Uh, last speaker on the list, Ivo Weigl. Uh, well, I leave, I Thank you very much. I can see that there are Slovenian interpreters available, so I will keep them busy. It is very characteristic of our debates when we discuss about the relationship between the politics and the media that for the last five years, since I've been an MEP, that false solidarity is shown when we speak about the relationship towards the media in a particular country. There were several examples of this kind. I won't be naming them concretely. And it was immediately seen that the defense wall was put up. It was very much ideologically um, characterized, and it was based on hypocrisy instead of principled defense of values that we should all be upholding. I believe that particularly when we speak of the new democratic countries, it is very often witnessed that the politics try to possess the media. This case was present in Slovenia. It still is present there. So politics get in contact with oligarchs and thus try to manipulate the media landscape. Obviously, we can observe a similar example in Hungary. So I would have now a specific question for you. In our example, it was proven that the only partner or alliance of the media can be found in the courts. I would like to know what is your Hungarian experience in this respect when you are trying to find also some support from the European Court of Justice when you are trying to fight the political opportunism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, uh, to ask the panelists to, make, to, to answer the questions and make some very, very short closing remarks because we're a bit behind schedule and we also want to leave time for the, uh, the second round. 
Um, but I think the, uh, the interventions, uh, the debate has been very rich. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, to take two minutes to, to answer and sum up each in the same order, starting with Mr. Noon. And I, I realize I'm restricting your freedom of speech, but yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. for good reasons. I, I will be short because I'm pretty new to this arena. Uh, as I said, uh, I have been working for the NGO sector since 1996, uh, and uh, politics uh, are not of my business, really. So I don't know how to give advice and how to share uh, opinions on, on, on issues like that. Uh, we reach out to EPP politicians. We don't know. We are grant makers. We are NGO people. We don't know. Uh, we, uh, we can't really use uh, uh, communication tools because we are grant makers and we are not communication experts. So uh, we are somehow in a very bad position in this situation that we uh, found ourselves in a situation where we are not working as professionals, but we are trying to follow things which are, which, which are not our arena. And, and, and therefore, I'm, I'm really puzzled what to say here. I really just wanted to share the, the situation around the NGO fund. And, 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 so, and I don't think I can give any, any, any good advice. What's the difference between Navrasic and Orban? Yeah, there is a difference, def de difference definitely. Uh, but I, I really think that uh, he can be challenged as, a, as he's responsible, I mean, Navrasic, for, for citizenship, because active citizenship is a very crucial thing in Europe, because we see that people are passive not only national level, but especially on European level. So taking into account the arguments they use in the case of the NGO fund against NGOs who try to be active in all fields of uh, life, what would be his opinion? What should be the limitation to active citizenship and participation in public life? Because they would really like to limit active part participation. They say there are good NGOs who are not uh, uh, questioning the power relations, and there are bad NGOs who are playing uh, in the public arena, and they have opinions. Therefore, they question the power relations of oligarchs and the political elite. And, and that's the bad uh, citizen who are raising questions, who are uh, pointing to problems and try to solve things. And uh, the Hungarian narrative is saying that if you are criticizing things and you are uh, pinpointing problems, then you are a bad citizen because you, you say that there are problems here. Why? You shouldn't. You shouldn't be here to, to name problems because everything is bright. <clears throat> Thank you very much. In that definition, there are plenty of bad citizens around here, <laughs> starting with myself. Um, Mrs. Kapronsai, via the web link, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, I have to say that I only understood those questions that were posed in English, so I will uh, limit my, uh, my uh, answers to those. As for the role of Mr. Navracic in, in, in uh, Orban's government, uh, we should keep in mind that he served as the Minister for Justice uh, in, the, in the government between uh, 2010 and 2014. So many of those uh, steps that I mentioned, starting from the fundamental law uh, and uh, through um, laws affecting the media and the judiciary, it, they were adopted under him being the Minister for Justice. So I think this is something that you can really raise uh, on, on the hearing. Uh, another note is that the Commission uh, took a rather cautious um, uh, role in, in this situation, even when it came to uh, certain infringement procedures, and also at the moment when uh, the police raided the offices of Okotash and Damnet, uh, they said that this is not within their authority to react to this. And uh, lastly, I would like to echo two of those 
toes that were uh, mentioned before. One is related to the Article 7 and the new uh, sanctions, uh, the new procedures that can be uh, imposed, that can impose sanctions on, on member states. I would like to ask uh, the European Union to use this tool because this, we are at the turning point at the moment. This uh, tool was never used before, and it is very important how you use it the first time. So please use it wisely but bravely and try to protect those um, those uh, core values and fundamental principles uh, that uh, you are there to represent. And uh, I also would like to echo the, the thoughts about the, the credibility of the European Union itself. And I think this is very crucial to react to such threats to the credibility of the Re European Union uh, in a way that is effective. And especially this is very important in times when there's huge apathy uh, and, and questions about the, the working of the European Union. So if you, uh, if you use these tools bravely, you can also talk to uh, the citizens uh, all across the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Mr. Mong? Yeah, thank you. It would be very difficult to answer some of these questions without publicly labeled traitor and uh, foreign agent uh, by the Hungarian government because advising MEPs uh, would definitely be considered as, as such an act. On the other hand, I don't think it's my role to advise you as politicians what questions to ask, but I think there is one thing which, is, uh, which should be emphasized, uh, and Shreffi emphasized already, that uh, Mr. Novracic was the Minister of Justice, and the usual line of defense uh, by government politicians uh, concerning these questions is that uh, all these, or most of these uh, controversial legislation were put forward by individual MPs, so not by the government. The government just approved finally in the parliament, but so I don't remember any instances where Mr. Navracic publicly criticized these very controversial uh, legislative uh, changes. So the government really approved and accepted um, important changes in legislation. And I would like to comment on one more question concerning the role of <clears throat> investigative journalism. Uh, our NGO is basically focusing on freedom of information requests. And what uh, the Fidesz government introduced last year was, is in fact, the legislation is called um, after our organization in the Hungarian uh, press, because what and Mr. Navracic assisted to, to this uh, change of legislation was that in the Hungarian, uh, Hungary has quite a good uh, uh, freedom of information legislation dating back from the 1990s. Fidesz introduced a new passage in this legislation which says that certain freedom of information requests can be considered abusive. If you are requesting too much information, like too detailed information, that can be considered as abusive. And the courts, and of course uh, now government organizations, ministries and municipalities use this passage at the court saying that we are requesting too much information. I think this is a really unique legislative innovation which Hungary introduced, among so many. So, thanks. Thank you very much. I actually filed a, a kind of freedom of information request to the European Commission. I got the same reply, saying my request was unreasonable, which it probably was. That's why I <laughs> asked in the first place. Um, Mrs. Gall. I'll try to zero in on, on two of the questions that were, um, that were asked, and one was about, uh, you know, what, what reactions that we, we've gotten thus far from, from the commissions when raising our concerns. And I think that, I mean, one of the problems, and I, and, and I did raise it in, 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 my, in my address here earlier, is that um, the, the commission has been very focused on very, very specific details when it comes to, for instance, infringement proceedings. And they very rarely touch on the broader rule of law aspect or human rights aspect as such. If you look at the case with the judges, for instance, uh, it wasn't looked at from a rule of law perspective. It was looked at as an age discrimination uh, perspective, which, you know, on the, which is fine as such, but that was not the major problem here. And this is often what, what at least in my experience from, from the Commission, when we, when we, when we, um, when we visit the cabinets and when we talk to co commissioners and their um, 
uh, employees at the Commission that, that essentially unless you can pin it to a specific directive, you will have a very difficult case to, to, to raise it as a rule of law or human rights concern. So, so that's been the general um, uh, reaction that we, we've gotten, that they're quite tied. Um, and that's why, I mean, I also raised these, um, I, you know, the, the calls that we do have uh, for the various EU institutions. And, and, I mean, there is a way of making better use of these proceedings and, you know, and to kind of keep the pressure on until the entire, like the issue in its entirety uh, it has been fully addressed and fully resolved. Um, so that's one thing. And then there was a question about how to, what to do in order to get the message across. Um, I think at this point, because there has literally not been uh, any action taken since, since last summer, um, even you know, forceful statements to make sure to, to speak out every time there is uh, an incident which breaches the, the fundamental values, the core values of the Union. I think it's, it's very important that members of the Parliament, the Commissioners, speak out openly uh, and denounce um, uh, you know, the, the type of, of um, the type of harassment, for instance, that civil society and media have been um, subjected to uh, at this juncture in time. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think your last plea has already been answered yeah. uh, uh, More by, <laughs> by this hearing. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to the panelists. Now the, the, the second and last part uh, of the session will be dedicated to uh, interventions by um, two key politicians. Uh, there was a request by Amnesty International, amongst others, for uh, a full-fledged fundamental rights strategy uh, within the European Union. Uh, the European Parliament issues uh, an annual report on the state of fundamental rights um, in, within the European Union. And last year, uh, my colleague Louis Michel, uh, also former commissioner, was rapporteur on the situation of fundamental rights. Uh, and we are going to listen to, um, to his statement first and then Finally, we'll listen to Mrs. Anne Brasseur, the President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Mr. Michel, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, ma Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, obviously, I'm pleased that our group, the Elder Group, has taken this initiative. Um, as many people have said this afternoon, it's critical that we should debate this issue in the European Parliament in order to condemn uh, the situation in Hungary, the way uh, fundamental rights are being uh, violated and the way democratic principles are being violated and the way the, the rule of law is being abused. I'd like to thank the representatives of the NGOs and the Council of Europe for coming along this afternoon and stressing the need for there to be close cooperation between all our institutions so that we can state clearly the uh, manifestations of infringements of human rights and totalitarianism have no place in Europe. I'd like to put a number of points to you. First of all, uh, I, and I'm sure you are, are very disturbed, in fact alarmed by the overwhelming silence and uh, institutional passivity which we see at, mo at the moment in Europe, in European affairs, in, in the light of the actions taken by the Hungarian government. I see silence in the European Parliament, and I find this unacceptable, being a member of the European Parliament. Uh, we are supposed to be a sort of sounding box uh, when it comes to defending uh, fundamental rights. And the fact is, our, our Parliament, um, in a way, has... Uh, silenced itself, has been muzzled by a, a number of political groups in this Parliament uh, who have res, uh, refused a plenary uh, debate on this very subject, Hungary. Uh, too bad, I'm afraid, but I have to say I find it disturbing and shocking that political groups which say they are democratic uh, are not accompanying us in this debate, our group, and indeed they are manipulating our rules in this Parliament to prevent a debate on Hungary taking place in the plenary of this Parliament. 
Uh, Sophie a moment ago was talking about someone who was wondering whether sanctions wouldn't in fact be counterproductive. I find that a strange way of thinking, but that's our, that's our fault because our institutions have refused to debate this issue and it ends up uh, with people thinking that perhaps uh, sanctions wouldn't be a good idea after all. And that means, therefore, that uh, the people of Europe, the citizens, no longer see us, perhaps, as a defender of their fundamental liberties, because we haven't defended fundamental freedoms in this particular case. Uh, and that is the first point I wanted to put to you. Another point is this. The European Union, our institutions, don't really have uh, proper tools, proper powers, coercive powers, in order to uphold and protect European values, values which, as we know, are universal values. If our institutions had appropriate tools, uh, we uh, wouldn't uh, have people uh, such as uh, the Hungarian government and the EPP group in this parliament doing what they do, the Hungarian government doing what it's do doing, and the EPP preventing a debate on Hungary in the European Parliament. Now, in my report on fundamental rights in Europe, it was the EPP group which strongly, strongly opposed a very simple proposal I was making, an obvious proposal, uh, whereby I proposed that we should have a uh, member state by member state report every year evaluating the human rights situation in each of our member states. Now, right now, the Fundamental Rights Agency cannot do that. This proposal was turned down. And also in my report, I added an annex uh, listing all the institutions in Europe, and indeed in the world, which monitor human rights. And then I, I, I was told that, uh, obviously they said, uh, this could not be an official European Union document, this uh, uh, listing of uh, human rights agencies throughout the world, because this wasn't in line, so they said, with uh, the rules and regulations of this Parliament. Now, we do have the Copenhagen agreements, of course, and I would say this in the light of those. Uh, what we could do is every year uh, is draw up a report evaluating the human rights situation in uh, each member state, which would have dissuasive value, and that, indeed, that would allow us uh, to move on and use uh, tools, coercive tools, to uh, make sure that uh, uh, make sure our member states uh, upheld human rights on their territory. The other uh, possibility is uh, a Copenhagen process, whereby you could have a, Copen a Copenhagen commission, where you'd have a committee of people about the usual political uh, struggle. Uh, you could have a committee of people uh, who are academically and intellectually unimpeachable who could themselves draw up a human rights report on each of the member states of the European Union and this every year. Uh, don't forget that when a member state joins the European Union, it commits itself legally to comply uh, with the European Union texts and treaties, all of which call for the up holding of fundamental rights and if states do not do that, member states do not do that, that of course is unacceptable and then there's another argument, a rather hypocritical argument which consists in saying it's not your business to deal with these issues uh, I would contradict that and say no indeed it is Europe's task to defend our universal values and principles now Orban said this and we, and I would reply, no, no, we do have a right to look into the fundamental rights situation in the Member States. It doesn't mean that Brussels is going to establish some sort of tyranny. No, or, uh, all we are doing is upholding, seeking, or I believe we should be seeking to uphold human rights and defending the rights of humans. Now, when we had our first uh, debate uh, with Urban, I mean, I, I pointed out that what he had in his country was the uh, tyranny of the majority. Uh, which can be the worst kind of uh, tyranny because the persons exercising that tyranny can also justify uh, their actions by saying we have a uh, majority and these are the arguments used by Orban he says he has the majority so he can do what he likes 
Now, somebody talked about uh, Mr. Orban behaving like certain heads of state in Africa. Um, and that is a, 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 a fair point. Um, uh, the, if we say that, however, in public, we are contemned for con uh, comparing a European leader, a European prime minister, with uh, prime ministers or presidents in Africa. Well, it's still a fair point. Now, on the question of Article 7 and the implementation of Article 7, the way it was used uh, after uh, what happened with Austria, there we used Article 7 in a preventive fashion. And, of course, now... Uh, neither the Commission nor the Council are proposing that we use an Article 7 procedure in the case of Hungary. Uh, we could have, they could have, but they haven't. The second point here, before starting an Article 7 procedure, uh, there are certain uh, conditions uh, which have to be filled. Uh, Four-fifths of the member states have to agree to starting an Article 7 procedure, and that, of course, is very difficult to achieve. So I think in this context, uh, we're not going to have an intergovernmental approach. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, last year, uh, Commissioner Vivian Redding uh, uh, said that she would very much like to have an appropriate European mechanism to cope with these circumstances and then the Commission said yes we need a new European framework to uphold the rule of law but that is rather uh, weak uh, uh, when it comes to dealing with what is happening in Hungary uh, and such a framework is just not going to be up to the job no uh, we really do need a stronger mechanism uh, to safeguard European values and fundamental rights. We really do need an institutional mechanism in order to deal uh, with the circumstances when certain member states go too far in terms of uh, infringing, upon, uh, uh, infringing human rights and fundamental values. The thing is, right now, the European Union cannot police, cannot uh, check what's going on or control infringements of human rights within the European Union and this undermines I, I believe the European Union and I have to say as a politician I, I do find it re deeply regrettable that certain political groups in this parliament refuse to uh, authorise a debate on such fundamental issues and the one with, as the one we've been debating this afternoon and uh, basically they're not promising, they're not doing what they promised to do when they were elected. That's what it amounts to, when they refused this debate in the European Parliament. Now just one last uh, point, one last point which I'd like to add. I was rather surprised, quite honestly, um, I was rather surprised when the European press, and we've been discussing the Hungarian press this often, but I was rather surprised when the European press failed to speak out more forcefully, which it should do, in the light of events in Hungary, what has been going wrong in Hungary. That's how I see it. I'm very surprised and upset that the European press has not come out more forcefully in the light of these events. And I think here the EPP has considerable responsibilities it has to bear I believe the EPP should have publicly condemned Mr. Orban publicly, publicly, instead of defending him and imposing silence upon the European uh, Parliament when all we're trying to do is exercise our rights as a Parliament Okay, we come to the, uh, the last speaker on the list, but certainly not the least one. I'm very happy that we, at such a short notice, uh, Madame Brasseur was able to come. President of, as I said, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, one of those last bastions uh, of human rights, uh, and always the one that is uh, really protecting and, uh, fundamental rights and speaking out. So you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing this event and thank you very much for asking me to participate in it as I represent
the parliamentary assembly of the council of europe so we have to defend not only the values for the citizens of the member states of the european union but of forty seven member states and what i have witnessed since a couple of years is that in different countries we are really going in the wrong direction because it is not only hungary but also other member states of the council of europe where human rights are really threatened the rule of law is threatened and democracy is threatened so we have really to stand up together and to speak out. last week i was in norway. i had the honour to chair the congress of the speakers of the national parliaments of the forty seven member states and there at the opening the norwegian minister for european affairs of course was complaining about what happened in hungary and then when later on in the meeting the speaker of the hungarian parliament spoke and he was complaining about the way the norwegian minister addressed the question and that they were interfering in domestic policy and i want also to tell you that it was really i was preoccupied by the speech of the president of the hungarian parliament because he said we have a majority and within our majority we are setting up laws in a democratic way in order to have our values and that the values are too liberal they want to impose to us. when i hear this ladies and gentlemen i am really appalled because the values we have are our common values and our common values are the values of the council of europe and as louis michel just said when a country joins the eu in his case the council of europe in the case i am referring to there are rules and those countries joined it in order to obey to those rules so you must really stick to the principles and those principles we share them together so it is not traditional values and on the other hand the european values or whatever you call them so that is very preoccupying i just because well my time is out it's seven o'clock it was i was told that we will finish at seven but what did we do as a parliamentary assembly when in two thousand and ten the hungarian government started to set up a number of rules in fact what louis michel called the well the abuse of majority we set up we made a motion and then we had a report but and that report asked to to start a monitoring procedure of hungary we have a tool at the parliamentary assembly for those countries who joined later on the council of europe to be under monitoring to see whether they meet the requirements of the council of europe hungary was is no is not under monitoring but we asked then well the rapporteur asked to open the monitoring procedure but that was voted down by a majority in the assembly and there i want also to say that we have there a protection of political parties and i think that's not the way we should do it and now i'm not speaking anymore as a president of the parliamentary assembly but as a former a former leader of the liberal group in in the parliamentary assembly i said in those days the rule of law has to be observed and the rule of law is not at the right side or at the left side or at the center the rule of law exists and there we have all together a responsibility but that of course didn't help and wasn't convincing so a majority said that we should not open the monitoring against hungary but as we thought we must give a follow up 
we now — we decided to have another — to have another report on the situation in — in Hungary, because I think it is really more than appalling what is happening, and we just had some information — we had some information here. I just want also to tell that the Council of Europe has different instruments to look upon. We have the Venice Commission. The Venice Commission gives — gives opinions on the drafts of certain — of certain laws, but the majority of — of the — in Hungary didn't take them into account. The Commissioner of Human Rights of the Council of Europe, he now is giving a report. I spoke to him this morning about Hungary, and he told me that he is going to publish his report beginning of October about also the situation in Hungary, because in July the Commissioner visited Hungary. And after that, he sent an official letter concerning the situation of the NGOs and expressing his — his concerns, and he's going to treat that. So I think the Council of Europe has a number of instruments to do it, but the instruments are not enough. We need the political will to do it. And there, I really also — and then I speak again as a member of the Liberal Group — we have to convince all our colleagues, whatever their tendencies might be and whatever our political divide must be, well, we must really look who is fulfilling the criteria and who is not. And if they are not, there must be sanctions. First of all, the monitoring, and after the monitoring, we have to keep pressure. And I think that is our responsibility, and believe me, I'm going to fight for it. And one last sentence. When I was a candidate to be a president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in January, I had a challenge here, because apparently for several countries, I was too dedicated concerning the defense of human rights. But if that is the criteria, they didn't want me. I'm proud to be qualified as such. And I will, together with you, and I think our cooperation is more important than ever. And I thank you for this roundtable we had. Thank you very much. And I think we have to continue together for the protection of the rights, not only in Hungary, but all citizens of the 47 member states. It's about their freedom. It's about their fundamental rights that we have to fight together. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very passionate plea for fundamental rights. And I think the Council of Europe could not have had a better president. So thank you very much. Now, we've already overrun our time, so I won't say very much anymore. But I'm very happy with the debate that we've had. I see that there were some colleagues from other groups in the room who did not ask for the floor. But everybody should note that they were welcome to do so. They were welcome to engage in the debate. And I think everybody who was here will continue to stand up and speak up for fundamental rights, because that is actually what the European Union is about. If people say the EU is not about interfering in national matters, well, the EU is very much about fundamental rights. That's actually the heart of the matter. We're not about the curve of cucumbers or the ingredients of marmalade or, indeed, the power of vacuum cleaners. If there is anything that the European Union is about, it is about values. That is what sets us apart from other parts of the world. And that's what makes it worth fighting for, whether we have the majority or not, even more so if we don't have the majority. And I think, ultimately, if we look at the election results of the last weekend, that is a stark reminder that in the face of the rise of extremism and populism and authoritarian forces, that we have to speak out even more forcefully. So I thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for your patience.
thanks to all the panelists, including on the other side of the, the web link, for your, for your strong interventions. And I'm very happy that you wanted to uh, share your, uh, your views with us and inform us. Uh, and I'm happy that we could provide you with the podium. And this debate will be continued. We will keep it on the political agenda. And I can tell you that the ALDE group has already put in a proposal an, a new proposal to put this on the agenda of the October plenary session, and we will continue to propose that until we have that plenary debate, and we will not relent. Thank you all very much.